Hello, and welcome to the next installment in our In Conversation webinar series. Today, we will be covering a variety of topics around the financial impact of COVID-19 and the travel industry. I'm your host, Janet Baptist, Customer Retention of FCM Americas, and I'm pleased to be joined by several of my colleagues from across the globe. Josh Robig, Vice President of Corporate Finance USA, Timothy Williams, Chief Financial Officer of Asia, Michael Sin Simon, Chief Financial Officer of Australia, and Adam Murray, Chief Financial Officer of EMEA. Before we get started, I would like to thank those who have submitted questions in advance. We have worked to incorporate many of those into our discussion today, and we'll be highlighting a few towards the close of our session. Now, I would like to welcome my panel. Welcome. Let's start by looking at regional insights. What have you experienced in your market and what type of indicators are you looking for that may signify a return to travel? Let's start with you, uh, Mike, uh, Tim. Yeah, not a problem. Thanks, Janet. Um, so um, look, I think we all know that China was the first hit country with this, followed closely by Japan, Korea, the Philippines. So Asia as a whole, you know, really was the first wave of what we saw as this eventually reached out to be a global pandemic. Um, you know, as restrictions tightened, um, so did our business and like so many, everyone had to react. So FCM, like many, had to navigate through a rapidly changing situation. Um, this included, you know, cancelling of flights, refunding, rerouting people, connecting people to get home to their loved ones. But no one was going to make this, no one was going to get this 100% perfect. Um, but I think, you know, through our customer-centric approach, high touch service, it really allowed us to repatriate and get everybody where they wanted and to work with clients to get what they needed. So where are we today? So today we're left with a very evolving situation. Um, obviously we went into this very quickly, but coming out of it is gonna be much, much slower than anything uh, you know, we initially expected or anything that we've, you know, we've been hoping for, I would say. Um, the bright spot by far is China. I think in China, we've seen recovery in our domestic travel market. I think we're around about the 50% mark as of, as of uh, last Friday. We're continuing to see strong growth in that, that market, especially as, as travelers become much more confident. Um, our other markets, however, will take time. And I think that's, that's really going to be very reliant on government bilateral agreements, uh, markets without any domestic footprint, like Singapore, for example, which is a 100% international travel market, significant long haul traffic. We don't expect to see recovery for quite some time, um, unless, again, those bilateral agreements are put in place, and, and there is a lot of talk of that around the world. So the first sign to return to travel is obviously the, by far is the lifting of restrictions by governments. Um, the bilateral agreements coming into place, these green corridors that everybody's been talking about. Um, second, very quickly and followed by this is consumer confidence. And I think you know, in China, we saw that it, it, with the lifting of restrictions, there is, a, there is a time lag between the lifting of restrictions, that confidence just going outside, and then the confidence to think about coming back to business and reacting and starting to travel. So um, business globally needs to stabilize first, um, and this will take time. Um, governments who have the means to stimulate recovery domestically first will also be able to then look at mechanisms and how they promote and, and develop international trade and markets. If we look at things like manufacturing and supply chain growth, you know, they're good strong signs for economic economic growth, but we also need to be you know, need to be careful on that because, you know, as we've seen in China and there, there was a number of articles around this, there was very strong growth in manufacturing. However, one of the challenges they have is they don't actually physically have buyers at the moment. And so I think as we start to see more of that evolve, we need to be very careful in thinking about, you know, what are true signs of that recovery versus what are those sort of shorts, those short signs that potentially could be misleading. Great. Mike, are you seeing the same um, coming down to Australia region? Yeah, uh, we, we are. Um, I think Timothy's hit the nail on the head. Um, well, from our side, we've seen obviously uh, domestic travel shut down entirely. Uh, when I say entirely, though, we still have a little bit of uh, of, of uh, sales going through. I think we're down 98% uh, um, across across the region in terms of sales for for domestic. Um, uh, but our corporate business, funny enough, is actually still ticking over. We're uh, we're still seeing a strong strong mining companies still flying, um, although they're not necessarily flying on scheduled flights uh, with Qantas or, or, or well, not Virgin anymore. But with Qantas, they're actually booking a lot of charters outside 
of uh, of the of the um, scheduled carriers. Uh, and our corporate business at this stage is still booking is fa well fairly healthy at about 15% um, uh, up. Uh, or sorry, it's not 15% up, 85% down. We call it 15% up. Um, but uh, signs for us in terms of a recovery very similar to what Tim was saying. Um, we, we are following China and, and, and other countries. Um, we're about two two weeks behind, two to three weeks behind, so uh, or lag from from the other countries. Um, and when um, so we, we, tr we track that. We're also looking not necessarily just at other countries. We do look at um, at our suppliers. Uh, and we start to see now in Australia the suppliers uh, like Qantas, for instance, are starting to put flights on from July onwards, um, and that's a good sign uh, in terms of uh, in terms of recovery. Uh, and then obviously, for, well, from an Australian perspective in particular, um, our internal borders um, in between our states, uh, we've, we've seen a number of our premiers and, uh, and statesmen saying that they'll open up domestic travel from about July onwards. So uh, that's a good sign for domestic travel, not necessarily any signs yet for international travel. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it, it hasn't been easy. That's great. Um, Adam, moving over in the natural progression of the world, um, into your region, how did how did you start to see things affect your your business, um, and what are you looking for for recovery? Yeah, I think I think we're just slightly further behind yet again that that natural curve that we're seeing. Um, but, but we've been in a situation now where it is pretty much a complete lockdown from a an international and domestic situation. Um, although we are now starting to see that. As, as Mike's mentioned, we've got we've got certain carriers who are, are putting on flights, and some of these graphs talk to this. You see capacity coming back into the marketplace. Although we need to temper, I think, some of that optimism in that we're still going to be very much dictated by by governments and their quarantine rules. So the UK has stipulated a 14-day isolation rule for anyone returning back to the UK. So that makes short short trips pretty much now and impossible from a practical sense um, so that is a little bit of a concern but we're definitely seeing capacity going into the market and we're also seeing a lot of mainland european destinations wanting to open up so people to some degree are getting quite excited about the idea of actually enjoying some summer holidays this year which i think a few weeks ago was, was probably completely dismissed but again some of these quarantine rules until we start opening up as tim talks talks to around bilateral agreements. I think there's still also going to be a certain amount of consumer nervousness as well um, around that. So I think it'll be slow. I think for, for Europe and especially the UK as a whole, so much of our of our business and our activity is international travel. Um, so we will we would expect to see like everyone else domestic returning quicker. Um, but I don't think that will have such a big an impact on if I look at our business compared to, say, domestic travel for, for Mike in Australia. Um, but there are pleasing signs coming there, which is great. And it's great to see that the industry at large is, is making movement and is taking steps. And I think the more we see of that, the more it will open up and it'll, it'll be a faster route to recovery for all of us. Great. And Josh? Yeah, thanks, Janet. Yeah, the U.S. has been, um, you know, very similar to, to Tim, Mike, and Adam. How they how they said their regions. Um, you know, we we obviously it was a very evolving situation where we had China travel shut down very quickly, Italy travel shut down, and we were working very quickly to with that evolving uh, situation. Um, and to the point now, as as we're all saying, where we're in pre pretty much complete lockdown. But we're a little bit different to to the other regions. Um, you know, U.S. being such a powerhouse in the in the in the corporate space, our domestic is you know 70 to 80 percent of our travel. So I think as as we start to see travel come back, we are are going to start seeing people travel more domestically. Um, you know, and thinking about obviously international travel, um, but it's it's very industry specific. We still haven't seen oil and gas um, you know shut down. Our oil and gas customers are traveling still. Um, our uh, construction companies are traveling, and and they might just be traveling in a in a different way. So some of them are jumping in a car and doing, you know, hotel stays. So we're still seeing strong land um, sales as an example. But you know, in, in general, I think we're gonna we're gonna lag the the other guys a little bit. Um, but we're gonna see the same trends coming through. Great. Well, thank you for that. Um, switching gears a bit, we're gonna talk about a, a big buzz topic in the industry right now, um, and that is with all these cancellations. 
what are the airlines doing to um, to potentially credit back some portion of those lost funds that have already been attributed to budgets and such? Um, what can what can we do? What are we seeing? And um, what would you recommend to to the buyer being our customer? So, um, Josh, do you want to go ahead and get started? As I know this is a big topic in in your region. Yeah, sure. So the U.S. is uh, and and I think globally, but you know specifically in the U.S. we've We've definitely created what we're calling like a task force, um, you know, both in our in our leisure and our corporate businesses to really really tackle this situation. We've got, you know, people in operations, people in product, people in finance working, you know, cohesively, um, you know, with with our suppliers as well to ensure that you know we're doing doing the best. But as you know, our suppliers are hurting, the industry's hurting in general. So it's been an evolving situation as to what each supplier is is doing in this space. Um, you know, whether they are refunding and, you know, there was periods there where they were refunding, uh, you know, straight away and then they started restricting it and, and stopping it. Um, so we've, um, you know, seen, seen very recently um, that a lot of, uh, sorry, I've, I've lost a little bit of my train of thought there, um, but I'll, I'll pass it on, sorry. That's great. So what about over in the European region, Adam? Are, are you seeing um, something different with the suppliers? Um, we are, um, to Josh's point, I mean, we, um, we we definitely, this is probably our number one priority is securing refunds for our customers. And we've seen um, three in responses from suppliers. I have to say, um, in the main, our suppliers, have been, they've been inundated with volumes and I think operationally they're, they're challenged. That's fair to say. So I don't think it's a, um, an unwillingness to provide refunds necessarily, but from a practical point of view, they are finding it quite challenging. So we've we've ramped up our resources to help with that. Um, we do continue to to work with some of the trade bodies here in, especially in the UK, whether that's CA or APTA, um, around what we can do um, collectively um, to get funds flowing, which um, we've had some progress on, but. I appreciate that for a lot of customers, this is an incredibly frustrating time for them. Um, and one of one of the, the the key things that has come has come to light and really struck us from a corporate point of view is where airlines are not actually providing cash refunds, but providing credits or the ability to transfer bookings, is from a corporate perspective, it won't necessarily be the same individuals that will need to fly in the future. Lots of our customers are, are, are restructuring, reorganizing things will move on. And I think finding a, a generic way of being able to, to utilize credits is a key part for the for our corporate businesses. Um, I'm not sure if, if you've seen that as well, Josh, in the States. Yes, uh, we, we definitely have. As, as much as possible, they're trying to hold um, you know credits, but where possible, we're working as hard as possible to get these cash refunds back to our um, you know, customers as, as, as quickly as possible. It's just been you know difficult airline by airline, right? So, you know, the big three here are, are definitely passing it back, but then you've got other carriers where, you know, we're using our negotiating power with the suppliers on behalf of our customers to ensure, you know, we're getting those funds back, but it's just a bit of a slower process. And as you said, Adam, that creates frustration for customers because, you know, we, we might be applying for that refund when that, that ticket was canceled and two, three months later, we haven't seen those refunds coming back. Um, and so, we're, we're trying to really make sure customers are aware that we are acting on your behalf. We, we are trying to get these, um, you know, this cash back to you, but it, it is difficult because we've also got, you know, fiscal responsibility to our company where we don't want to be, you know, passing funds back where we don't actually have the funds. Um, so it has been a, a little bit of a tricky, uh, let's call it a bit of a minefield to navigate for all of us, I think. Um, but, you know, we are working actively and on behalf of our customers to do the best we can to ensure, you know, that we have the best outcome. I, I think Josh, though a lot, a lot of it also is education for our customers to be able to, for the customer to understand, also that we are, we are the agents and we don't have the cash. Um, and I think that's, you know, from an Australian perspective, you know, we, we've, um, we spend a, to Adam's point also, it's, it's our number one priority, uh, and just educating the customer because the customer obviously has a perception that, well, book through, through, through Flight Centre. Uh, and wants flight center to pay them the money, um, and uh, uh, we obviously, if we don't have it, to your point, if we don't have the cash, we can't we can't give the money back. But I think what 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 a good outcome here has been is that um, 
is, is and this just shows the benefit of of our model and and, and booking through a, a, a sustainable and reliable travel agent like flight center or or corporate travel or fcm is that we are we do have the capacity to fight um and to and to get the the refunds back from the airlines um in in most cases in, in, unless obviously they, they're pushing credits um, whereas if you were just an individual and you'd booked uh, online and you'd done it yourself, you'd be having to go to the suppliers yourself to uh, to try and get that money back. Uh, and it is, uh, and as as Adam said, they've got a huge amount of uh, of backlog, um, and you just become a, a you know a a number in a queue trying to get your money back with the rest of the thousands. So I think that certainly does uh, does stand say, say a lot for 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 our business. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, being the advocate has become quite important for us during this uh, period of time. Tim, I know you were sharing a bit about, you know, how how China handled this originally. It was a little unique at the time, I believe. You want to talk talk a bit about that since it hit you first? Yeah, I think. Look, I think um, you know exactly what Adam, you know, Josh and and, and Mike have been saying. I mean, there's. I think communication is a big thing here, and this is something that we did a lot of from a China perspective. Um, but you, you have to be realistic here, um, especially markets that have domestic, because they've got sheer the sheer amount of volume associated with domestic travel means that you know for for the airlines they've they've also got to be able to cope with that. Um, the other thing that I think you know definitely in the UK, you know definitely in the EU, I will say um, you know UK. Um, you know, places where you've got strong regulatory environments and, um, you know, the, requ the requirements are that you have you know, certain obligations that you have to meet. Now, this is a unique situation where it almost goes above and beyond that. And I think, you know, Adam actually touched on it a little, a little bit before, but we also have to remember that even from an airline perspective, um, a lot of those airlines have had to, you know, they've had to furlough employees. Um, and so they don't even have the same capacity from an employee employee count to actually be able to to generate these refunds for people. Um, and so credits is you know is is obviously an option there. I think there's a few things which you know, and this is where you know Mike touched on the benefits of a of a travel agency um, and, and, a, and a trusted one. Um, the reality is that we have the ability to communicate with different parties. We have the ability to communicate and educate to, to our customers in the end to, to, to help them better understand the situation. And I think there's, you know, the usage of credits is one thing. Um, I think one of the things airlines will need to be a little bit cautious of as we sort of come out of this is, um, and I know we will potentially touch on this later, is the cost of, um, you know, what happens with the cost of air tickets in the future and how do those credits get applied? Um, you know, are the tickets five times more expensive than they were and the credit only covers, you know, one fifth of what they used to. And so there's a lot of these, there's a lot of things that, to be honest, I would say are being talked about that need to be addressed further down the line. Um, but I think generally that it all comes back to the main thing. I think the communication aspect back to the client is probably the key thing um, at this point in time. So I think it's fair to say this is new for all of us, um, airlines and GDS is included, but we are working um, on the ground with, with the right subject matter experts and our partners to, uh, to make sure we're fighting on behalf of our customer and, and getting the right sure. outcome. Yeah, great. All right, so switching gears again, um, we have hopefully a, a good amount of um, our customers watching this and maybe some CFOs amongst them. So as uh, peer CFOs, can we talk a little bit about um, what you've been doing yourself um, within our business and what advice we may pass along to, um, to our customers, what they could be doing right now to review their travel spend um, and be re better suited for, for coming out of this. Adam, do you want to go ahead and get started? Yeah, sure. So, um, and, 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 some, and a lot of this would won't really come as a surprise, especially Ooh. to anyone in the finance community but um, right from the get-go the number one priority for us as a business was to to really understand our cash runway um, in an environment where we're seeing almost no income whatsoever um, just really understanding the rate of cash burn was an absolute priority for us um, so that was the first thing and at the same time turning off all the discretionary spend um, which we were able to do relatively easily um, and then for us as a group, it was really about how do we, in a, in, a, in a time of absolute uncertainty, and I know we looked at the graphs earlier and we constantly talk about 
where are we at on the curve and have we passed the peak? We don't really know where this is going to finish. And for us as a group, our priority then shifted to how do we secure a, a cash runway for circa 18 months? That was, that was the sort of assumption we had to. Our, our number one priority was to, to maintain that sustainability. Um, so that's what led to some of the, the capital raise we, we did out of Brisbane. Um, and extending some of our credit facilities. So for a group, we're able to communicate to, uh, to all our stakeholders and especially our customers that we, we have funding in place for a, for a runway of around 18 months. Um, and I would imagine that's a priority for, for most companies to, to lock in that, that cash runway as quickly as possible. Um, and then as we've moved from that, it's about starting to reimagine our business. Um, as we work through a period of hibernation where we've got very little trade, our focus shifts to reimagining what our business can look like as we come out of hibernation, and then which parts of our business do we prioritize um, to come back? So those would be all the traditional metrics around profitability, ability to generate cash, um, those functions which provide the best return. Um, and we have definitely done that across all of our brands, and I'm sure it's a sort of exercise that, that most CFOs will have been heavily involved in, continually modeling various scenarios, and, and I would probably guess that most CFOs have taken a very conservative approach um, in their planning um, because of the level of uncertainty. And I think I will constantly come back to having to plan for these high levels of uncertainty. None of us can base our plans around hopeful returns, latching onto green shoots and, and hoping for the best. We have to really be locked away with some certainty around how we're going to move forward. But I would imagine that's, that's a routine across the group, and I know some of the other guys will be able to talk to that. But I would expect most businesses to have gone through a similar plan. Mm. Mike, you're very um, close to it all in the heart, uh, being in Australia, our home country. So I'm sure um, you've had quite a few discussions with our senior leadership team and can probably share some, some great advice. Yeah, uh, you know, Adam's, Adam's um, explained it fairly well in terms of how we... Uh, we, as an organization, had to move into hibernation phase and we had to move into that very quickly. Um, and with that has come some really tough decisions. And, uh, you know, we've had to, uh, across the various regions, stand people down and, and shrink to a workforce that uh, that is really just uh, a, a shell that, that can keep, you know, keep the lights on. Um, I think, though, what it, what it uh, has done for us as an organization and certainly what, I, what we're talking about in Brisbane and uh, and, and uh, with our, our senior leaders is that's given us an incredible opportunity to reshape and rebuild our business um, into uh, even a bigger and better business. Um, you know, we've managed to, we're looking at old habits, old models um, that we've, uh, and, and legacy models that we've uh, always wanted to change, always wanted to move. Um, and we knew that, uh, that it would take a, a large amount of effort to do here we have an opportunity where we've basically come down to a grinding halt, and we uh, and we can rebuild the, the rebuild this business. So when when Adam's talking about the reimagine phase, um, it's incredibly uh, it's incredibly invigorating to 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 be in this position, and uh, and we're fortunate enough to be able to rebuild and and as I say, come out stronger. But it's not just going to be, and I think this is quite critical. It's not just going to go from hibernation into rebuild phase, into this new world. Um, there's going to be a long transition period. Uh, it's going to take us some time to get there. And uh, we as, 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 as a management team and CFOs alike um, need to be uh, extra mindful in terms of how we come out of hibernation. And we just don't go back to our old ways and start spending money and, uh, uh, and, and, and forming to what we used to know and what we used to do. Um, you know, it's going to be an entirely different world going forward. And um, I think this transition period is, you know, to Adam's point, it's probably going to be 12 to 18 months before we genuinely uh, come back. So uh, I, we, we see in here in Brisbane as an exceptional opportunity and we're very excited about it, actually, um, to, 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 get, to get rebuilding. Yeah, that's great advice. I think all of us need to take this as a, a lesson of what's positive from, from where we're at and what was positive before and what the new positive will, will be and bring it all together to hopefully um, be in a better position for, for us. Um, Tim and Josh, anything additional from your areas? Yeah, I, I think, um, you know, I think Mike actually nailed it right at the end there. I mean, I think for us, it's, it's an, you know, we're now moving into this stage where 
let's be honest, most people, if you haven't gone into the stage of understanding your business and starting to rationalize what you needed to do at this point in time, you're a little bit, you know, a little bit, if not a, a fair bit behind the eight ball, um, you know, now's the time to start thinking about where, you know, where do you go? Where, where, how do you come out of this eventually and do it in a smart way? And then how do you start to capture opportunities as you move forward? And, you know, not, we, got, we also have to understand not every single industry is in the same situation. There are industries that aren't, you know, obviously aren't hurting as much as others, but, um, but generally, I mean, when you look at travel and travel as a means to really ignite, um, commercial growth for you as a company, I mean, that doesn't exist, right? I mean, it doesn't exist today. And so people have to be smart about other things. But I think one of the things I just really wanted to touch on here is you know, now is the time for leadership. CFOs are a part of you know, leadership teams. And the fact is now is the time to be brave. You know, it's to make the calls that have to be made. It's to understand the things that probably didn't always sit at the top of the pile. And and now's that time to, to be looking at those and making those decisions that need to happen. And so I think um, doing that now is the best time because, you know, very, well, I won't say very quickly, but we are going to come out of this economically. The world is going to come out of this. And at that point in time, there's going to be a lot of noise and a lot of opportunities that people will start focusing on. And, you know, we can miss the opportunity. So now is a great time to be excited about the future, but also to take decisions that need to be taken today. That's great. Yeah. yeah, Josh, what does the future look like for the U.S.? One thing I'll add as well, obviously, um, you know, we all we all touched on it. Fiscal responsibility and, and cash management is key. And I think, you know, all CFOs would have gone through this exercise with the downturn we, we've seen. But, um, you know, with this reimagining, we are 100 percent investing in areas where, um, you know, as as Mike said, to, to build off, um, you know, we've got this opportunity to basically reimagine start from you know scratch almost in a, in a way like zero based budgeting is you know finance term it's and so thinking about you know where have we um you know where can we improve for our for our customers what what can we invest in you know data is going to be everyone talks about how data is key but data is going to be more key coming out of this um for our customers so we're heavily invested in you know the corporate space right now in analytics and and dashboards for our customers so they can start thinking about what this looks like as it comes back what you know what uh countries are coming back online what government restrictions and putting that in a way where we you know i know in the scm space we have a new dashboard out as an example that you know we're really you know pushing that investment um a, across the group um as well as but one other one other point i just want to make was around supply negotiations as well both internal and and for our customers you know we've we've definitely all gone through that but we're also thinking about that now um specifically with our airline partners and our and our hotel partners um you know that's that's something that we're working heavily on to ensure we're getting the best rates um, for our customers into the future. So Josh, I just realized you said a, a million dollar word and that's data. And um, I have to give kudos to this group for a group of financial um, individuals that we went about a half an hour without actually talking about data. So it shows what a big topic that this, that this is. Um, and I think it is people first um, and, and even up at the upper levels and in the financial layers you know you talk you've talked a lot about that um aspect of of, of the people so um so yeah i was, just, of, I was just impressed that josh threw on zero based budgeting there so <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's pretty good that's pretty impressive <laughs> Um, so now shifting into uh, what we could say is is probably uh, an impossible feat um, for any of us. But if you have the answer to this question, I think um, you could probably be come out of this pr pretty well. Um, but what does travel look like in the future? You know, what what what's your prediction of how things could change from the business perspective, but also from the traveler experience per perspective? Um, it's it's a big it's a big topic, but I'm sure you all have some thoughts. Um, and then what do we have at the, at the Flight Center side that may help support our customers you know, into this new world? Josh, do you wanna start with that one? Yeah, tough one, right? <laughs> what do we imagine the, the world to look like? Look, I think um, we're, we're definitely gonna see uh, you know, some nervousness initially with, with travel um, you know, coming back, I think. A lot of a lot of things right now focusing around having maybe interim travel policies versus um, your, your regular travel policy. And it's going to very much uh, focus on duty of care and and safety. Um, so it's really going to be, I think, heavily dependent if we're thinking international travel on what what governments and um, 
you know, are, are doing and allowing um, and what the trend looks like in terms of how this virus is being handled. I also think as well, it's going to come down to what our suppliers are doing. So, you know, right now, airlines, hotels are coming out with all their, um, you know, different things they're working on, whether it be no middle seat, moving passage, passengers around. It's going to be, you know, very focused on that. But in terms of, you know, what, what we see, we're definitely going to see domestic travel, obviously, um, you know, pick back up pr pretty quickly. So I think we're going to see that come on um, first. Tim, starting to see things open, are you seeing some of these predictions already happening? Um, yeah, look, obviously, I mean, the biggest one by far is the uh, is the duty of care um, and the travel safety that, that Josh uh, spoke about by far. And I think um, it's it's really about, look, there's, there's a lot of different factors that go with this. And I think that's going to definitely be by, by far the biggest one. I think this is where technology really comes into play. And I mean, you know, I talk from an FCM perspective, um, but, uh, you know, if we talk about from an FCTG perspective, the reality is that, you know, we have a great suite of technology products. We're developing new ones. We've invested heavily in that. And that's really going to help around, you know, the traveler safety, around the awareness for travelers. So for travelers, you know, what's actually happening? You know what, what's happening today. What are the latest alerts that we get that we're getting? You know, how do I know that my end-to-end -end trip experience is going to be seamless? But look, just from a prediction perspective, I think there's a there's a couple of things which which are key here. Um, the speed of travel. So if you know if you think about the average airport time, it's you've got to be there one to two hours before a flight. Um, at the back end, you're somewhere between thirty and you know sixty minutes in the airport. You know, what happens if that becomes four hours at the front and 90 minutes at the back? So then, you know, one stop trips become less popular that, you know, so direct is obviously much more, um, you know, is, becomes much more viable for the business traveler, for example. Um, it's how do you work with airports? How do you think creatively to try and, you know, circumvent that and reduce the time? So I think those are some of the things that are going to be very key because obviously business travelers don't want to spend five hours in an airport. Um, you know, what are governments doing? Um, and I think one of the key things, which, you know, I have heard this from a couple of clients already, but what is the past track record of those existing clients at, in, in the current situation and, and what do they want to think about? And then you kind of move into um, some of the things people probably don't think about. For example, you know, does the travel insurance cover my travellers? And so if not, what is the potential financial risk um, for for the company, if they have someone who goes, you know, on a business trip, they get sick on the way there, and then they're stuck in that in that country at the time. So, I think there's there's a lot of factors that need to be thought about here, um, and I think, you know, that's where this you know, the, the whole duty of care piece is going to be at the forefront of everybody, because I think the other pieces will sort of will start 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 to look after themselves. The only other one which I just want to touch on is, you know, a lot of people talk about, and you see a lot of different opinions around what's going to happen between things like, you know, is this the death of business class versus economy and so forth? And and I just don't see that happening personally. Um, I think the reality is that while some companies might look to adjust programs in the short term, the reality is a lot of these have other factors at play and that can relate to, you know, hiring top talent and what is the expectation of the type of talent that you're hiring and being an appealing employer. And so I think, I think a lot of that will actually balance out some of these some of these things that we're hearing at this current point in time yeah so just to add into that Tim I think um, you talk about the airport duration um, I, I reckon and I might be wrong on this but I reckon it's going to be very similar to what we saw in in, in the 911 days where uh, you know security was ramped up and uh, there was this hype around the airports and and as you said you had to get there two or three or four hours before it before to to, to travel but um, I, I can't see that being a sustainable um, uh, airport experience. Um, you know, it, it will probably be there for for some period of time. I, I agree with you. I think we will. You know, it will be a longer period that you have to, to pre-check in and and, and but uh, you know, 12 to 18 months um, out, I think we'll start to see the airports having to lift restrictions on in, in terms of how long that takes. It's no, it's in no one's interest to try and make that journey any longer. Uh, the airports will try and push push their, their the customers uh, and, and through. The other thing that I think that also is quite important, which you mentioned from a uh, insurance perspective for for the actual trip, um, but I think it just once again I mentioned it earlier in terms of uh, you know uh, the value of a travel agent. Um, I think for, for CFOs and businesses going forward, who you choose as your travel provider becomes even more important. 
um, you know, having a, a sustainable uh, partner, a travel partner like FCM or Corporate Traveller, um, where we have a, a strong financial standing that is going to still be around uh, even in the tough times. I mean, this is the worst pandemic to hit the world globally, economically uh, ever. Uh, and we are still going to survive it. So I think um, you know selecting your selecting your travel partner is going to be even more important um, uh, for 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 customers, um, as well as who your suppliers are going to be. Um, there's a lot of airlines and and hotels that haven't made it through this crisis. Uh, we've got one in 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 Australia alone, Virgin, who's who's struggling. Uh, we've seen SAA in South Africa. We've seen Mauritius Air. We've seen Thai Thai Airways. Um, you know, there's there's a lot of suppliers that are struggling, um, and I think the the way and how we select who we partner with going forward is also going to be very different, and we need to be careful about that as not only as as travel retailers, but um, also I, I would caution our customers to to make sure that they select the right um, the right travel provider. And obviously, I'm a big fan of FCM and corporate travelers, so obviously that that would be us. But um, yeah, I think that's going to be different. Yeah, great. Adam? Yeah, a little bit to, to Mike's point. I think we, sh we shouldn't really underestimate the shock impact that, that this pandemic has had on, on us as an industry. And I think we will definitely see, I mean, a lot of people are, are struggling, and even though they may survive this, they probably won't come out of it in a particularly strong space. So I would expect to see far greater consolidation of the marketplace, especially um, in corporate. I think if I look at the UK, still incredibly fragmented market but um i just don't see how that's going to be sustainable going forward so unfortunately i think um size is going to become more and more important and i think we're, we're very well placed as, as a global entity to um take advantage of that so there will be opportunities for us and i think the other thing that's going to really change is and this has been talked about a lot in in, in the uk and in europe around consumer protection and I think what we've seen here and back to the we discussed in depth around refunds and, and that situation for consumers, there will there'll need to be a, re, a complete rethink, I believe, of just supply chain finance um, throughout the industry. And, and what are the best metrics for being able to provide that protection for our consumers? Um, the, the Civil Aviation Authority in the UK previously operated a, a fund which, to be honest, was completely wiped out with uh, the collapse of Thomas Cook. And, and so, so their coffers are particularly empty. I know there's a lot of talk of, of trying to establish trust accounts for most leisure businesses, um, which will put a significant demand on working capital for, um, for a lot of businesses. Um, but there'll be a lot of, lot of debate. And I think mean, definitely in the UK, the, the consumer piece is uh, at the forefront of everyone's thinking here. So I do expect this to be quite a bit of regulatory change in what's already a, a pretty highly regulated market for us. Yeah, I think, Adam, you, you touched on something that's really important there. And, uh, you know, I think when you look at some of the other industries out there who are very highly regulated um, or have seen significant regulatory change in the last, you know, let's say decade, just governments need to be a little bit careful there not to stifle the industry um, and make sure that, you know, in effect, there's so much regu regulation on it that it can't it, it can't grow out of it. And I think that's something where, you know, the likes of, of major travel agencies, major travel management companies like uh, Flight Centre Travel Group and, you know, can work with those with, with those regulators to really help shape that so that the industry can flourish but it does, and it doesn't end up, you know, stifling growth so that we're sitting here in five years with you know still trying to come out of it that's great so we have received a few questions so we'll um transition into those so we did touch upon quite a few of of the questions that we had during the um during the session but um an additional question that came through is in regards to hotel and plane costs so do we expect the cost to skyrocket due to uh, reduce capacity, at least in the short term, um, and the additional spending that the suppliers need to go through to, to ensure the cleanliness? Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in first, and, and then Mike, I might flip it to you because I think you're seeing something similar off the back of ours, but I'll talk about China as an experience. So 
in China, when we look at the, you know, when we look at the price of tickets, you know, they were significantly lower than normal um, to begin with. But we have seen that starting to creep up um, back to more normal levels as obviously as traffic grows. And I think that's what I think generally most markets will probably see that there'll be sort of this this push to try and get something moving. Um, and to attract people to come and, and want to fly. And then from there, you know, I think we'll start to see that growth. Um, yeah, sorry, you'll start to see the price of tickets starting to increase and so forth. I think the longer term um, view is look, it's a very, very competitive landscape, um, especially when you look at air, you know, when you, we talk about airlines. So I appreciate that we might be talking about sort of reduced capacity or we might be talking about increased costs and so forth. But the reality is, I think. I think over the longer term, I think the general supply and demand nature of what happens will probably keep some of that in check. Um, but obviously, we're very early days, and we'll have to see where that where that starts to to, to turn turn towards. Yeah, one hundred percent. I think you're you're um, you're right there, Tim. You'll see the airline. They have to stimulate demand. They have to get the customer back uh, and uh, get over this period of anxiety. In terms of flying, so you'll see uh, you'll see air prices fairly low. But at the at that being said, you know, based on most airlines business models is based on volume, um, and they you know they make very small margins on their on their flights, um, and they have to be selling a large amount of seats um, and volumes and flying their metal 10, 12 hours a day in order to make uh, any decent money. So uh, I agree with you. I think uh, we'll probably see it fairly fairly low for a while and then it'll creep up. Um, in Oz in particular, what will be interesting to see is, is what happens with Virgin. Uh, you know, we only have two, well, we have two major airlines, Virgin and, and Qantas, and Virgin's gone into administration at the moment. Um, and uh, I, 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 I suspect Virgin will have an investor and, and, and come out of this, but if they don't, uh, it will be a really interesting landscape with Qantas being the only airline um, providing travel or well, the only major airline providing travel within Australia. So then we'll see prices really skyrocket because they'll have a monopoly. But um, let's not let's not uh, count our chickens before they hatch. Let's see what let's see what happens with Virgin. Right. And our next question is in regard in, in regards to travel policy. So are we reviewing our own internal travel policy? And as CFOs, what role may you be playing? You want me to go? Yeah. Look, we, we definitely are um, reviewing our uh, internal policies, you know, quite um, quite closely. As I said, um, and we, we touched on before, it, it's going to be heavy around, you know, duty of care, um, you know, to, to start with. But we definitely don't want, um, you know, our, our travellers going going anywhere that, you know, we don't want them to go, that, you know, that puts them at risk. Um, also, whether they don't feel comfortable um, but it's going to be heavily customer focused for us probably to begin with. I think we've all learned pretty quickly that um, whilst it's not the best and, and we, we do want that human interaction that, um, you know, Zoom has or, or Teams or whatever you're using at the moment has has been an effective mechanism to, to still keep in touch, have those business meetings. Um, but we're definitely going to have a have a customer forward um, mindset with our travel policy to begin with. So whether that, um, you know, we, we have a saying, winner maze retain in, in the corporate business here in the US. So it's definitely a, around um, working with our customers, um, you know, from a retention perspective, working with them to, you know, discuss now as we've uh, spoken about on negotiating their rates, right, working with suppliers, things like that, working very closely with them on their travel policies um, before we sort of move to internal travel and, um, you know, having those meetings together. That's great. So again, that people aspect, I think, continues to uh, to prevail. So um, appreciate everybody's time today, Adam, Mike, Josh, Tim. Hopefully everybody uh, watching along gained some interesting tidbits and insight into everything COVID as it affects the, the travel industry from a financial perspective. Um, and again, from a people perspective, because we are a people business. So I um, want to make sure everybody is, is out there traveling safe um, or at home safe, because that is the, the top priority here um, as we move into the future. So again, thank you everybody who listened along and for submitting questions. Um, we look forward to seeing you on a future In Conversation webinar and hope everybody stays well. Thank you. Goodbye. Thanks guys. Yeah, thanks.